In our previous lesson, we learned that after the death of Samudra Gupta, it was his son Chandra Gupta II who now ascended the throne. Now, in ancient and medieval times, there was a tradition of assuming very high sounding titles after one's coronation as the king or the ruler. Likewise, after Chandra Gupta II ascended the throne of the Gupta Empire, he assumed the title Vikramaditya. This was a way to establish oneself as more powerful, as more prominent in the eyes of the subjects. Vikramaditya had already inherited a huge empire from Samudra Gupta. But like a very powerful and courageous ruler, he did not want to restrict himself. He had further ideas of expanding the Gupta empire, which is why he defeated the last of the Shakas. Now the Shakas ruled over the western part of the Indian subcontinent and Vikramaditya defeated the last of the Shakas in order to expand the Gupta empire to the western part of the subcontinent as well. Now look at this map very closely. Here you can see this indigo color shows you the region that was conquered by Vikramaditya and annexed from the Shakas. Now this is the area that was already under the control of the Gupta Empire and by further annexing the territory of the Shakas, the Gupta Empire became this huge in size. Now do you think Vikramaditya defeated the Shakas and annexed the Shaka kingdom without any reason? Most definitely not. Because these rulers were very strategic. They were always looking for ways to expand their territories as well as to amass more resources and wealth. Likewise, Vikramaditya also had different plans when he went to annexing the Shaka kingdom. This is because by defeating the Shakas and extending the Gupta Empire to the western part of the Indian subcontinent, Vikramaditya was now able to establish trade relationship with Europe. How is it possible? This is because when the western part of the Indian subcontinent was under his control, he could now establish a trade route with the Roman Empire. And a trade route between the Roman Empire and the Gupta Empire was very, very significant. This is because the Gupta Empire was able to trade different items with the Roman Empire. And this also helped in the increase of the wealth of the empire and this increase happened exponentially. So this explains why Vikramaditya was very keen on expanding his Gupta empire to the western part of the Indian subcontinent. Now, to annex new kingdoms and bring more and more territories under one's control, a ruler needs to have a very powerful military strength. Most of these Gupta rulers relied upon their very powerful military resources. They had very powerful military and naval strength. Likewise, Vikramaditya also boasted a very powerful military strength of 5 lakh infantry, 50,000 cavalry, 20,000 charioteers, 10,000 elephants and a powerful navy with 1200 ships. So here you can understand that with this infantry, cavalry, charioteers and elephants, Vikramaditya was able to wage many wars and defeat many kingdoms on land. And at the same time, this powerful navy also helped him exercise control and power over the water bodies that surrounded the Gupta Empire. So this is a way in which Vikramaditya managed to annex more territories and in the same light, we should consider the annexation of the Shaka kingdom. 
but how do we get to know so much about chandragupta the second or vikramaditya because it is not possible for us to know out of nowhere how different rulers implemented their own administrative and military policies hundreds of years ago well in order to get information on chandragupta the second we rely upon sources like the sachi inscription and the gold coins of chandragupta the second these provide us very reliable and very useful information on the military and socio political career of chandragupta the second or vikramaditya now here you can see a gold coin that was minted during the rule of chandragupta the second now chandragupta the second was well known for his benevolent administration he was a very good ruler as well as a very benevolent administrator he was not very harsh and cruel and bitter to his subjects he also loved art and literature now in our previous lesson on samudra gupta we learned how he was also a patron of arts and in fact samudra gupta's court poet harishena called him kaviraj or the king of poetry and here we get to know that his son vikramaditya was also a lover of literature and art now a very important point about the court of chandragupta the second or vikramaditya would be that his court was adorned by the navratnas or the nine gems now when we talk about the navratnas i'm sure you remember the name of the mogal emperor akbar well many centuries prior to the rule of akbar it was in the court of vikramaditya where the navratnas were there now this navratnas were nine gems or nine scholars from different fields like science like medicine like art and literature let us now find out about some of these navratnas now before proceeding with this lesson and learning more about the navratnas let me ask you a question which gupta ruler's court is famous for the navratnas is it the court of chandragupta the 1st samudra gupta or chandragupta the 2nd well the correct answer is chandragupta the 2nd it was chandragupta the 2nd or vikramaditya's court which was very popular for the navratnas let us now learn about some of these navratnas now when we come to discussing about these navratnas we need to take into account the fact that these were scholars and learned men from different fields we begin our discussion on the navratnas by talking about aryabhata now aryabhata was the most famous scientist in the indian subcontinent around the 4th to 5th century ce he was a great scientist he was not just a scientist he was a mathematician he was an astronomer now his work aryabhatiya gives us a lot of information which are still used in modern sciences now aryabhatiya is a compendium of mathematics and astronomy so it means that aryabhatiya contains both mathematics and astronomy now in the mathematics part in aryabhatiya we get to know about trigonometry algebra arithmetic now these are lessons that you study in your today's maths classes but you'll be surprised to know that these ideas originated hundreds of years ago and these could be traced back to aryabhatiya which was the most famous book written by aryabhata now aryabhata is also the person who came up with a very scientific explanation of solar and lunar eclipses 
it is for this reason that aryabhata still continues to be influential and important in today's mathematics astronomy and various other scientific disciplines now it was not just the sciences that developed during the rule of vikramaditya because medicine was also very very developed medicine was also given stress by vikramaditya and we get to know this from the fact that dhanvantari a noted physician of ayurveda was also one of the navratnas in vikramaditya's court so as a lover of art and literature and knowledge as a whole he extended patronage to learned men and scholars of different fields and these are certain examples of this fact any discussion on the navratnas in vikramaditya's court shall remain incomplete without a mention of kalidasa now kalidasa is often considered the greatest of india's ancient poet and playwright he wrote a lot of poems and plays which continue to be very very relevant in today's literary world as well among the body of very famous and influential literary works that were composed by kalidasa some of the most famous works would be meghaduta which is a lyric poem and avijnana shakuntalam which is a sanskrit play now we learned that vikramaditya was a lover of art and literature which is why literary works greatly flourished during his rule now let us find out about some other literary works that were composed in and around the 4th and 5th centuries ce here mention must be made of mrichakatika which was written by sudraka and mudra rakshasa which was written by vishakadatta in fact mudra rakshasa tells us about the rule of chandragupta maurya and how he came to power with the help of chanakya now chandragupta maurya ruled in an empire that is under the mauryan empire that came prior to the gupta empire but it was during the rule of vikramaditya that these texts like mrichakatika or mudra rakshasa were composed now i am sure you are aware of the very popular hindu epics which are the ramayana and the mahabharata now the ramayana and the mahabharata survived through oral traditions prior to the gupta period but it is only during this time that the ramayana and the mahabharata got their final written form that is to say prior to this the ramayana and the mahabharata was spread among people through the oral tradition these remained as stories which were told but now these stories got written into the form of huge epics along with being great patrons of art and literature the gupta rulers were great patrons of knowledge as a whole which is why around the 5th century ce the nalanda university was built under the patronage of the guptas now let me tell you a very interesting fact about the nalanda university it was the first international university to be built not just in the indian subcontinent but in the entire world it was a huge university and it could be found in a place that is situated in the present day indian state of bihar let us find out more details about the nalanda university the nalanda university housed the largest library in ancient india 
Now it had millions of handwritten books. Can you imagine how huge this library must have been in order to house and keep millions of books? Let us now discuss the cultural importance of this university and what happened to it later on. In the present day Indian state of Bihar, the Nalanda University was constructed. Now the word Nalanda could be broken into three Sanskrit words, Na, Alamda, which means there is no stopping of the gift of knowledge. Scholars and men from different parts of the world came to study here and they could study here without paying any fees. But centuries later, Bhaktiar Khilji destroyed this university. He burnt millions of books in the library. Only some books have survived with the Chinese monks. So, for reasons more than one, the Gupta period has been termed as the golden age of Indian history. Because developments and crucial changes were taking place in different ways, be that on the fronts of science, on the front of education, on the front of medicine, on the front of politics. So you can understand how this was a period of holistic development, which is why the Gupta period is known as the golden age of Indian history. The Gupta Empire spanned across a huge portion of the Indian subcontinent. And the Gupta Empire was also known for its very well implemented administrative policies. And these administrative policies under most of the Gupta rulers were also very benevolent in nature. So this was a time when the development and well-being of people were taken care of in every possible way. And this explains why the Gupta period is known as the golden age of Indian history. In our subsequent lesson, we will try to focus on certain aspects which made the Gupta empire so powerful and so magnificent in stature. To be very specific, we will be focusing on the Gupta administration in our subsequent lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.